starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, this is Chris. It's today's July 31st. Hope it uh, finds everybody doing well. Hard to believe another month's uh, rolled by and a lot of us uh, have our kids or grandkids heading back to school here this month. So summer's kind of winding down. Um, with the market being fairly flat, I'm gonna uh, just kind of go through some similar things today. Um, try to reduce a little bit of the, the time period, just kind of make this short and sweet. Uh, so let's just go ahead and, and uh, get started. So as a reminder of uh, the power of the pattern, we hope that uh, you know the power of the pattern helps you see uh, see the charts, see what type of action ought to be taking place, not take a lot of time to see why we have an opinion on a chart. We want to be your 30-second advantage to chart analysis. As a constant reminder, we're not bullish or bearish. There's uh, opportunities on both sides of the fence. Uh, I'm not a, a PERMA anything other than I'm a, a PERMA opportunist that uh, I continue to believe that opportunities uh, have just as been or as great now as they've ever been and as frustrating as a sideways market can be. If you go back and look at, you know, the, the last time the market went really sideways for, you know, a year and a half, uh, it, it made 50 percent in less than a year once it broke out. So patience led to great opportunities and patience again will lead to great opportunities. So I'm gonna continue on the theme that I used in the sectors report uh, in, in this week's uh, or this month's uh, Connect series uh, in kind of falling in line with Clint Eastwood's uh, famous movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And just before we get started, there's uh, many good things going on. There's really not a lot of bad things going on. Uh, we will discuss uh, where some bad vibes could come from and then I want to just share with you, it just kind of like the Boy Scout piece, is you want to know what would take place that could really change things or be fairly ugly for the bullish case. So let's go ahead and get started and, and look at the good and, and also what could be really great. And so one of the good things that's taking place from a, a, a bullish perspective or the health of the marketplace continues to be the advanced decline line. So in the upper left is the advanced decline line on a uh, weekly basis and the advanced decline line on a daily basis in the lower right. But as you look at the upper left, the trend is very solid to uh, the upside. Uh, there's no uh, divergences taking place here. We'll discuss that in, in the next slide. You can see that since 2009, it stayed in a very uh, strong uptrend. Uh, I did highlight in uh, 2007 at one, you can see again that it was in a, the AD line was in a solid uptrend. It did start diverging a little, but it did hit the top of that uh, rising channel and it started heading lower. So um, you know, if we would see weakness up at two, which is at the top of the, the channel, it wouldn't be uh, outright bearish right away by any stretch, but this would be a place where the bullish case would prefer not to see the advanced decline line head south. So in the lower right, from a daily perspective, that covers uh, most of the month of uh, July. You know, In our seasonal stock picks, uh, we shared with you that even though the summer can be typically, you know, the dog days of summer uh, can be quiet. That the month of July actually over the last 10 years has typically been up around 140 basis points, 1.4%. And the, the market is going to close the month higher from a uh, Dow, uh, Russell, S&P, and tech uh, perspective. You can see in the blue shaded area that the AD line for the most part over the last three weeks is pretty much chopped sideways. So I don't think it's going to surprise you any. That's uh, neither bullish nor bearish, but the trend does remain up and it's just uh, essentially not made much net progress on the advanced decline line on a daily perspective. This chart comes from good friend Ryan Dietrich and uh, Ryan did a great job here. And this is why the uh, Ryan highlights why to me the advanced decline line is very important. So this is two charts. The top chart is the S&P 500 going back about you know, what, 60 years, six decades and the AD line uh, below that. What Ryan did in a pink shaded area was highlight divergences. So you'll see the first divergence that uh, took in the bottom was in the mid 60s, started heading south uh, before the market uh, started heading sideways. You know, the market uh, for the most part, especially on a Dow perspective, at the time this divergence took place, the Dow stood at a thousand in 1965 and by 1982, it was still at a thousand. So, it didn't make much progress. The S&P 
made a little bit more progress, but not much to brag about. There was another divergence that started in 1998 that uh, started heading down a couple of years before the market peaked. And we saw another uh, divergence of, of several months uh, in 2007 before the 2007 financial crisis got started. So the positive here is, as you can see at two, there's no negative divergences taking place. This doesn't mean that the AD line has to stop, you know, right here by any stretch, and, and it could. But one of the, the things that you typically want to look for when uh, real weakness tends to come into the market is when the advanced decline line starts acting soft ahead of time. In other words, you see that negative divergence. So this has continued to be a good or slash healthy news for the, uh, the bullish cases. The AD line is at all time highs. Another thing from, you know, on the staying on the theme of the good is this is a look starting in the upper left, the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the middle row, the Russell, mid caps, and then value line. And then even turning over to Europe, looking at Germany, France, and, and London, uh, the trend on all of these is up. Um, the the six-month sideways chop in any of these indices has not broke the long-term trend. Uh, all of these are also above uh, long-term 200-day moving averages. So, the, so Good news uh, for the bullish case, trends are up, solid movement. Um, the thing that I do notice is, you know, that most of these are facing uh, the top of long-term trend channels. Uh, a person could say, well, this is resistance. Sometimes uh, a valid argument is, how do you have resistance in an upper channel or an upper trend? Uh, but this is, could be at least where markets could take a pause. But uh, again, from uh, this is a good perspective that trends remain solidly up from large to small caps uh, to very broad-based indices and, and also in Europe. We started sharing back in January this chart, which is taking the 2007 highs, 2009 lows, applying um, Fibonacci to the monthly closing prices in 07 highs and uh, 2009 lows. And we shared with you that on the S&P that the 285 level is the 261 extension. So we started sharing in January when this was hit that uh, we felt until it's taken out, it's the 800 pound gorilla. And we haven't tried to, to share that we have a, a bearish situation at hand, but we've tried to prepare you from a trading perspective, a patience perspective and a mental perspective that we felt like this market would trade sideways for months to come. And that, uh, you know, capital preservation would be the, the main theme, just sit back and, uh, Expect to be in a rocking chair where it can keep you busy, but not really have any net progress. So, you know, the, the main uh, levels is 285 on the, the uh, S&P. Uh, we're currently trading around 280. So we're within a couple of percent, less than that, uh, from a, a breakout to the upside. If that would happen, that would be the good to great news from a bullish case. So the, the one thing that, uh, as I mentioned in the yellow box down below, Bulls would not want this to be a double top. Uh, I don't, I'm not saying that it is, but this is where you wouldn't want to really see selling pressure take place right back at the January highs. But again, um, as I shared in this week's sectors report, with the advanced decline line hitting all time highs and uh, these markets above 200 day moving averages, the odds are this is that this market will break to the upside versus have um, a really serious decline to the downside. And, uh, to change that scenario, we need to see more divergences in the shoebox indicator, uh, the equal weight, uh, cap weighted indices, staples, discretionary ratios, and the advanced decline line acting weaker before you could really see probably a lot of selling pressure come into play. So now the good could move to great as far as what could be the uh, Fibonacci targets if there were upside breakouts. So this looks at the Dow, has the same uh, applied uh, highs and lows of 2007 highs, 2009 lows. You can see that the uh, 261 level comes into play around 26,700. You know, I, I didn't highlight it here, but this is the was the 161 uh, level, everyone, where the market traded sideways for almost 20 months. And once it broke above the 161 level, this is the 50% rally that took place in, in about a year's time. So the one thing I want to highlight is if the markets can take out, you know, with the AD line at all-time highs, if the market could take out the 26,700 level, the Fibonacci forecast uh, for 
the Dow uh, for the 361 level would be a target of around 34,000 in value. So taking the same uh, idea and applying it to the S&P, if SPY would break above the 285 level, the next Fibonacci extension target being the 361 level is around the 361% ex extension level is around 360, 365 on the S&P. So I, I want you to be prepared that uh, if there are upside breakouts uh, above these this 800 pound resistance zone, don't be surprised to see uh, buyers come into this market and push it higher. With that in mind, you know, there's there's several opportunities as this market has chopped sideways. Shared this in last week's uh, sector reports, but just wanted to, to remind you that from uh, there's several S&P 500 stocks that are several, uh, they're, they're a good size from a market cap perspective that are uh, in upward trends and they've traded from in this sideways chop, they've actually traded from the top of the trend down to close to the bottom and they're creating potential bullish falling wedges. So I have a, a computer alert set that if these stocks would break to the upside, I want to be a buyer. So just real quickly, I'll just share a, a couple of them. Uh, CFC, which is a Citizens Financial, is uh, close to uh, support uh, of the uh, couple of year rising channel and also a bullish falling wedge. If it would break out to the upside, I'm going to look to be a buyer. Also, uh, Alaska Air, ALK, a very similar case. Again, if this one would, uh, it remains in a long-term channel, it's testing rising channel support. And if it would break out above the bullish falling wedge, I'd look to be a buyer. Uh, pick this up today with a ACM, a similar case. You'll notice that numerous bullish falling wedges have taken place in 2016, again, in late 2016, 2017. So the, the trend remains up, uh, higher lows, and higher highs, and we have a potential another bullish falling wedge with a breakout being attempted, you know, here. So these could be uh, some really nice opportunities, even when the market is flat, that these things have, have chopped, been frustrating, just like this stock has went from around 40 bucks down to 32. So there's a 20% haircut that's taken place that if these would break out to the upside could be uh, presenting some nice opportunities. So as I said at the top of this, there's really not a lot of bad things taking place, but I want to share with you what would be some bad vibrations that the bullish case should pay attention to. And so one of the things that uh, has been, you know, I didn't have anything to do with inventing it, but a lot of smart money people watch the discretionary staples ratio, which is XLY, XLP. So when, the, the, when discretionary is outpacing staples, that's typically sending a positive uh, message to the bullish stock case. And as you can see in the blue shaded area, the trend of this has been up and it has been very steep uh, starting last year in 2017 and heading higher. And that steep rally took it to the top of its trading channel where right in here, a couple of weekly bearish reversal patterns took place. So the sharp rise that's highlighted in this rising channel also caused momentum to reach at a level that hasn't been seen in, uh, in over a decade. And so this thing really needs to cool off. And so you can see over the last several weeks, the ratio has been soft and it's working on a, uh, a break of the you know, one year steep rising channel. And so at two. And so this, uh, if this would continue to, uh, to head south, that would just send some vibrations that the bullish case would want to be aware and cautious of. Another one that uh, we've shared in the global dashboard report several times is the divergence that's taking place in, in junk bonds. You know, I, I like that saying, it doesn't matter until it matters. And so far it has not mattered for almost a year. But early, uh, I've been in the business about 18 years. And in uh, 1998, junk bonds started diverging in this first pink band. And they sent a caution message, bad vibrations to the stock market for almost two years. And I'd be very humble. I, I just began to wonder that maybe it was broke. Maybe it just doesn't mean anything anymore. And the old phrase came to mind, maybe it's different this time. But it didn't end up being different. Junk bonds, uh, in my opinion, I'll be very surprised.
range if they can ever diverge that long again ahead of a serious decline in stocks. Now roll forward um, seven years, we saw a seven month divergence take place in 2007 and then stocks finally you know, rolled over. So uh, bad vibrations would come into play if junk bonds continue to, to diverge. This is the second longest divergence in uh, 20 years and especially if rising support would break uh, at one at the S&P, which is not ha has not happened. But the bullish case would get some uh, vibrations that would be a little uh, concerning if we would see both continue to break down at the right side of this chart. So <clears throat> another uh, vibration that we'd wanna watch for in the bullish case is the Russell 2000. The Russell has uh, uh, small caps, mid caps and micro caps have been uh, strong this year compared to large caps. It's been a good uh, year for these uh, in 2018. Uh, but we did apply the Fibonacci levels to the 2011 lows and the 2015 highs. And you can see that uh, just a few uh, weeks ago, the Russell ran into the top of its rising channel and kissed, just came within 1% uh, of the 161 level and has continued to chop sideways. So going back to the movie theme, the good and the bad, the good would be is if the Russell takes out uh, the 161 level, I'd want to be an owner and it would send a positive message from small caps. A, uh, not a bad vib a, a concerning or bad vibration would take place if the Russell would break support line two. So another one that we want to watch closely from a, a, a vibration perspective or a, a, a bad vibe or message would be the Dow uh, taking, taking on some weakness at the top of this rising channel. So this looks at the Dow going back to uh, around 1910, 1912. It's a monthly chart. Uh, the Dow has spent the majority of the last 70 years inside rising channel A. You can see that this channel influenced uh, the Dow in the mid 60s that the low in 1982 took place at the bottom of this channel. The high in 1987 took place at a parallel channel. The 2000 high took place. Um, so the thing that, I, that comes to my mind is the, these, uh, the Dow formed megaphone patterns. A breakout took place and then a test of the old resistance of the megaphone as new support and then it rocketed higher. So we've got a similar look here at three. We see a breakout of the megaphone pattern a double test of the old resistance new support and then it rocketed higher. But you'll notice that it hit the, uh, the middle of this channel in 1987 and backed off for a while. So we have another test of a long-term top of this channel taking place. It hit it in January and that's where the markets went sideways. So not only is the, one, the 261 extension level important, but so is the 70 year channel is taking place. And monthly mo momentum, as you can see, when you look back, on this uh, 70, 80 year chart, monthly momentum is at one of its higher levels. And uh, you know, the peak in 2007 took place here, 2000 took place here, 1987 took place here, and 1929 took place here. So the monthly momentum is definitely elevated and some bad vibrations would take place if we would see uh, selling take place just under the top of this channel with momentum this high. So I want to say that I don't see ugly things taking place, but I want you to be prepared of what ahead of time of what do I want to look for from a really an ugly message to the broad market. So one of the ugly messages would to me would come from home builders. Home builders uh, led the market down uh, in 2007. Actually, they started heading south in 2006. And this is a monthly chart. So you can see some bearish reversals took place in 2006. And you can see the index started heading south. We all know that home builders and real estate is a, a very key part to our overall economy, not only in the States, but around the world. And so uh, home builders took it on the chin. As you can see, uh, this, this index was trading in the 40s, traveled all the way down to eight. So just a a massive decline uh, going into the financial crisis lows. They've had a, a wonderful rally that took place. But what gets my attention is the rally uh, into earlier this year, the January 
reversal pattern that took place. This is quite a large bearish reversal pattern or a bearish wick. It took place exactly at the 2006 highs. So that gets my attention that has a chance of being a double top. Definitely home builders have diverged against the broad market. And this monthly chart has, as you can see here, for almost four months in a row, these are bearish reversal patterns. You know, it starts attracting some buyers and then it sells off at the end of the month. So it's attracting some buyers, sells off at the end of the month. Again, this month, so tried to attract some buyers and sold off. So buyers really are, are drying up, uh, you know, in this, at, at the top of each of these monthly patterns. And so we'd get ugly news from a leader if the support line at number one would break, especially after these reversal patterns. So we'll continue, uh, I will, to share this, and I have in, uh, in the sector's report, but I just wanna make you aware verbally here that this would be uh, one leading sector that would send an ugly message if support would break here. And, and I wanna say this too, just because we highlight 2007 with this, I, th I think, you know, people just automatically revert. Oh, because Chris is bringing this comparison up. Oh, he's talking about a monstrous decline, 50% decline, 80% decline. Hey, folks, that's not true. I'm just wanting to share with you, this is where selling pressure can take place and weakness can come in. I'm, I'm not smart enough. I just want to be really humble to know uh, how great of a decline could take place. I don't have any idea how great of a decline, if one will, and how big it could be. But this is a key support point that, as a leading indicator, the bullish case could get would get an ugly message from this key sector if it breaks support. So another one that <clears throat> would send an ugly message that was also uh, a leading indicator uh, pre-financial crisis was the bank index. So you'll notice uh, in 2007, the bank index created the proverbial descending triangle where roughly two thirds of the time this breaks down to the downside. So the key to these patterns is a series of lower highs and flat bottoms. And you'll notice in 2007 that banks broke support, then came up and, and knocked and kissed on the other side of what was support as resistance a couple of different times, and then they just fell apart. So uh, the rally, uh, this index fell uh, over 85% had a strong rally from the 09 lows. You can see since uh, 2011 or the last seven years, it's made this uniform rising channel, but the rally has it uh, kissing the top of its rising channel, just underneath the 2007 highs to where banks could be forming another bearish descending triangle. And I don't think I'm gonna tell you anything new that banks this year haven't done terribly, but they have lagged the broad market despite the idea that interest rates are rising. I'm not telling you anything new that uh, the, the idea of uh, rising interest rates can benefit the bottom line of banks, and typically uh, banks do better in a rising interest rate environment. So the, the really good news for the banks would be is uh, they break out of resistance here. This uh, being a leader that they are, this would be a negative message if banks would break support of this descending triangle after peaking at the, uh, similar heights to the 2007 highs. So this is a NASDAQ composite index. I've been sharing it uh, weekly uh, in the sectors report. There's just no doubt the trend is up in tech. Uh, the trend is up in fangs. Yes, there's been a little bit of um, digestion, some uh, concerning declines uh, recently, especially with the Facebook 20% hiccup in a day last week. But I just want to share, you know, that the majority of the last 18 years, tech has remained inside rising channel one. Uh, it is trying to break out above this channel. Again, this is weekly. So this would be this week. There was last week. You see a potential reversal pattern uh, on an attempted breakout. And there's potentially a doji, doji star topping pattern. So, again, no price action of late has broken the long-term trend. But uh, the bullish uh, case would get some ugly news if this rising wedge pattern would break support at three. So it has uh, not happened. Uh, you know, Apple earnings are coming out uh, today after the market. And as we speak, Apple's up 3%, uh, you know, roughly. We're long that position. 
uh, like seeing that. It's about seven and a half dollars at 197. But again, um, want you to be prepared that uh, there's, I, you know, I haven't mentioned shorting any of this stuff today. I'm not going to mention shorting it because I don't see that is a, a viable uh, thing to do. But if we would see support break uh, and a few other things take place, it would definitely send an ugly message to the bullish case. Another leader is being the semiconductors. Almost looks like the the uh, um, the home builders in a, in a in a way. This is a monthly chart. You can see uh, semiconductors at the 2,000 highs created this reversal pattern, fell enormously into the 2009 lows. Have this beautiful rally. The trend is still up. Uh, semiconductors have chopped sideways for what, seven months, uh, right at the uh, 2000 highs. And so this month, semiconductors are up. You see this uh, green bar. They are uh, kissing the underside of 2000 highs. So let's go to what could be uh, good to great news. If semiconductors would take out uh, the 2000 highs and break out to the upside at one, that would be very good uh, message from the leadership. It'd be a great message to tech. It'd be a great message to the broad market, and I would want to own SMH if it does. If uh, semiconductors, for whatever reason, would roll over here, it would be an ugly message from a leadership perspective. So there's obviously many things that are going into this choppy uh, market. Um, as I shared uh, last week, there's a, a, a very much a lack of conviction taking place. That's a telltale sign of a side, sideways market and a telltale sign of that's why you want to just sit back and watch versus trying to be very aggressive in a choppy marketplace. One of the things that I haven't addressed uh, now, I wanted to let some time go by, but back in uh, February, for uh, all of the members, we did a whole series of monthly hangman patterns. And hangman patterns took place in many leading indices uh, back in February. So it closed the uh, the month of January uh, at a pretty high price. That's how these are formed. Then these indices fell, you know, seven to nine percent quickly, and then they rallied back to close the end of February, fairly close to the uh, the January closing highs. And so, what I wanted to just kind of uh, update is this is the NYSE index. So it's obviously one of the broader indices out there. But you'll notice that a hangman pattern took place in, in 2000 here, highlighted in red. But the market didn't fall apart right away. Actually, you can see uh, one month, two months, three months, four months uh, afterwards, five, six, seven months. It wasn't that much difference in price from where the hangman took place. Then selling took over. The 2007 high, another monthly hangman pattern took place. It was softer. A few months afterwards and then it came back up to have a counter trend rally that uh, was at the same levels as where the hangman the lower body of the hangman pattern took place and then the market fell off hard so here was the hangman pattern highlighted in uh, red or pink in february of this year and you can see the sideways action that's taken place now not all indices look this way if when we look at the nasdaq it's above uh, january highs russell's uh back at above January highs, mid cap, micro cap. So not all indices are that way, um, but this is one of the broader indices that we should pay attention to. So uh, this this is not proven a thing. Uh, I'm glad, as I said back in February, to, uh, to waste your time discussing the hangman pattern. I'm happy to have an omelet on my face that this was a meaningless discussion, but I still wanna make you aware that you know this hangman pattern is on the charts it's still there the market has struggled uh making much headway to the upside since then but it's also not fallen apart but if we would see selling take place and uh, the nyse would break below the february lows this hangman pattern is probably sending an ugly message to the broad market so uh, i'm not going to spend any more time on this but that hangman pattern is there and so the good news for the bullish case would be break above the January highs, hangman doesn't matter. If it breaks below the February uh, lows, the hangman probably does matter. So again, uh, this choppy market continues, and until the choppy market ends, just you have to expect more of the same. So this, this picture, uh, I, th I thought, was really apropos for some of the sentiment things that we're seeing of late. This came from sentimenttrader.com. Uh, this is the uh, 
the flows into stock funds over an eight week average. So one of the things that's taking place is a lot of outflows. Even though this market is within 2% of all time highs from an S&P 500 perspective, people are bailing out of the market. And you can see that over the last seven years, whenever this type of outflows took place, these red dots reflected that the market was a lot closer to a low than a high. So from a sentiment perspective on fund flows, this is actually a positive. And if this market would break out above the January highs, you know, if the S&P would rally, say, 4%, which would take it above the January highs, these people that sold a lot of stuff, they were on the wrong side of the fence. And so they could actually come back to the market, which would be a positive if it break above the 261 levels. On the flip side of that, I think it's interesting is that smart money, <coughs> excuse me, which is in the blue line, you can see at the, the highs of earlier this year, smart money was walking away. And they were actually very right. They were walking away before the 9% decline. Red money, the red line's dumb money, and dumb money was getting rather confident. So I think it's really interesting now to see almost the polar opposite is that smart money of late is actually getting fairly concerned and dumb money is getting a little bit cocky. And now that's almost the polar opposite of the prior chart because typically the market is closer to a high than a low when we see smart money doing this. This is a, an update uh, from this morning on the CNN Fear Greed uh, Index. You can see it's at the 66th level. Extreme fear, uh, where market lows usually take place around zero. Ex extreme greed is obviously uh, at 100. Um, the, earlier this year, it, it, even though the market had a high and, and fell off 9%, it never reached an extreme level. Uh, we are close to the highest level we've seen in a while, so it's not in extremes, but there is a little bit of cockiness that you can see that's worked its way back into the market. So I'm going to move just real quickly to something that from the lethal group that caught my attention that this, these were stuff that Sir John uh, Templeton tried to make me aware of in the late 90s. Um, so just kind of hang with me here. But what this is, is uh, we all know that PE ratios are um, judgmental. There's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. They're typically not really great timing tools. But I just this one kind of caught my attention. Uh, some people could say from a fundamental perspective, the market is overvalued, but currently, uh, according to, to this company, the, um, the PE ratio on a normalized basis is around 25 times. And so what they did was these are the different quartiles, and then these are the future returns of the S&P three years out with the, the different PE ratios. So you can see going back uh, over the last 61 years, that when uh, PE ratios were in the upper quartile, the average S&P 500 gain three years out was 1.3%. Versus when you look at the, the opposite side, when PE ratios were low, the average PE ratio, this is when stocks are cheap over here, the average three-year gain in the S&P was 17.7. So this would suggest that, uh, does it mean the bull market has to end? No. Does it mean the bull market has to top here? No. Does it mean a, a big decline has to take place? No. But I do want to empower you that historically, this is not where quality bull markets have historically gotten started. Uh, and uh, this would lead one to, uh, from a, uh, an investment strategy perspective, want to be more into trading compared with buy and holding. So this is the same type of a study here. Uh, on the right, but on a 10-year annual rate of return, when uh, stocks are cheap and PE ratios are low, the average 10-year return on the S&P was about 16.4. And then you can see on the flip side, when stocks are expensive or the PE ratio is where it is currently, the average 10-year gain is around 3%. And we all know we invest in stocks to try to get our money to grow. We're trying to uh, compete with the cost of life, which is inflation. And so, you know, inflation has averaged, you know, uh, in the two to three percent range for many decades, for half a century or more. So, you know, from a, a net perspective, this is about a zero percent gain for a decade. So these are things that I, I, I want to make you aware of and uh, why we want to 
uh, be flexible with our assets and, and not really expect that, hey, we can just buy and hold and, and do extremely well. So just uh, as we're getting close to the end here, I just want to kind of talk about to me one of the most uh, important commodity you know, in the world, which is crude oil. Uh, with this chart, it's a monthly chart, and I applied Fibonacci to the, uh, the monthly closing highs here in 2008 and the lows in 2016. And you can see that the rally that's taken place, look at these large bullish reversal wicks that took place here at the 2016 lows, also in the 2009 lows. The rally off the 2016 lows has uh, taken crude to its 38% retracement level. And then this month, um, as we're closing out the month, crude hasn't fallen uh, big, but it has backed off at such a key level. And monthly momentum is uh, the highest since right here, which was the 2011 high. So for commodities overall to do well, to me, the king of commodities is crude oil, and sometimes crude oil can impact the stock market. So a big uh, test is taking place for the crude oil complex. Now, crude oil can uh, break above the 38% retracement level, which you can see is around the $74 uh, a barrel range. Uh, if it does, it could, it could rally quite a bit. So I wouldn't be afraid to be a long, long energy if it could take it out. But don't be surprised for, uh, for some heavy price action, which we've seen this place to be taking place at the 38% retracement level. One of the things also that has my attention is uh, what smart money is doing in crude oil. This was the 2014 high before it lost, what, 60% of its value. You see that smart money had this extreme crowded trade taking place. Then at the 2015 uh, lows, uh, smart money uh, really had a, a different type of an extreme going taking place. And now we have a very crowded trade taking place right now. So. As crude is uh, testing the 38% retracement level uh, from a, a hedger's position, they're really, uh, the, the, to me, the, the dumb money compared to looking back at 2014 is betting crude is going to go a lot higher. The smart money is hedging ag against that right now. So this would be really important for commodities that if crude would sell off here, it could ripple into the, the larger commodity complex. And so this does look at the larger commodity complex. This is the Thomson Reuters equal weight equal weight commodity index uh, looking back over the last uh, 30 plus years uh, on a monthly basis. So there's just a couple of channels that uh, continue to get my attention. The long-term trend in commodities is still up despite the hammering they've taken place over the last seven years. So you see this rising blue channel that started in 2001 is still in place. Uh, the highs that took place in the late 80s and then the highs in 08 here and 011 hit the top of the channel. So you notice that it banged against the top of the channel a couple of times, and well, now it's testing the, the bottom of the channel numerous times over the last uh, couple of years. So a uh, key su uh, support test is in play here. You can see this is a monthly price pattern that it is trying to break below it. There's a potential bullish reversal pattern taking place. You see that wick right now at key support, but also just to keep in mind that uh, there's a following trend channel that's taking place over the last seven years and commodities a couple of months ago hit uh, the top of this falling channel and it's 23% retracement level and then sold off hard. So the fate of uh, commodities, you can see right down here, this is a blown up piece of the chart above. We're testing multi-month uh, lows of this past year. There's, you can see where that reversal pattern is taking place. So the fate of commodities, which can also send an excuse me, important macro message to the economy is very much uh, in hand at the support test one. One of the things that interests, in, intrigues me uh, right now that uh, was the, I saw out on the web was um, this kind of a, just little observation that Vanguard took its gold and precious metals fund and dropped the name gold from it at the 2001 lows. So after uh, this fund had struggled for years and years, a couple of decades, right at the bottom, they took the name gold out. So this uh, article is kind of uh, a little bit of interest from a contrarian perspective that uh, Vanguard now is dropping the name precious metals entirely. Currently right here, after what, seven years down, a couple years up and uh, gold and silver have been struggling so far in 2018. 
So the struggles, you know, so while this uh, Vanguard is changing the name, uh, I don't think we should go invest in metals just because Vanguard changes the, the name of its uh, fund, but this isn't the first time that fund companies have uh, closed funds at almost the exact wrong times. So this is an update on sentiment. You can see that gold sentiment uh, is uh, around 26% uh, right now. And other times that gold was around 26% uh, when such few bulls, there was a few times that it was a lot closer to lows than highs. Then in the lower right looks at silver and you can see its sentiment is at 28%. So uh, right now, there's not very many people understandably uh, bullish the metals complex. So while we're in these uh, sideways choppy markets, I, I wanna continue to update you on stuff where there is some extremes taking place. And one of them is an extreme and frustration in the metals uh, complex. Another one's in coffee. Coffee's really stunk it up uh, over uh, you know, set the last seven years, but also this past year. But one thing that intrigues me is uh, a really crowded trade is taking place in coffee. When hedgers uh, accumulated this position, coffee was very much closer to a low than a high. Then the, the trade flipped and coffee was much closer to a high than a low. Traders flipped again. Uh, coffee was much closer to a low than a high. Traders uh, that amassed a, a different crowded trade here, coffee was much closer to a high than a low. Again, much closer to a high than a low. And now tr the tr traders or hedgers, excuse me, have uh, accumulated or amassed the most crowded trade uh, in the last nine years. So historically, we'll see if this time is different, coffee is closer to a low than a high. And so if coffee would rally, it would really surprise a lot of people as a lot of money essentially is just shorting the heck out of it right now. So staying on the coffee theme, just kind of wanted to let you know, this is coffee monthly seasonality. And you'll notice over uh, the last couple of decades that coffee historically is around the low in the month of August. So you can see it's around the middle of the month. So I want to just let you know that you can see that between now and uh, the end of the year through February, coffee is traditionally up uh, more than it is down. So we want to look for uh, decent entry points. So this is a 30 year look at coffee futures. And you'll notice along the blue shaded line, this uh, price level, which we'll just call it 105, 100 to 105, doesn't matter, uh, was support. You can see it was resistance, was support. Not a lot in here. It was support a couple of times with some really violent action. Again, several times became into support, support, support. And so it's testing uh, its 23% Fibonacci retracement level and uh, the 105 zone that's been support numerous times uh, over the last decade. So again, this could be a fun opportunity uh, in the out of favor uh, coffee market. So uh, we're entering the month of August. Um, as I began earlier in the, the webinar, I shared that July is typically up uh, in August. Over the last 10 years, uh, the month of August is typically soft. This was an interesting chart from uh, Ryan Dietrich. It doesn't show really a seasonal trend, but it, it does show if uh, August uh, is up, it's up uh, on average about 3.2% uh, over the last, what, 38 years. But when August is soft, it's the softest of, of any given month over the last 40 years with an average decline of 4.5%. So again, this trading range becomes very important um, in the seasonal pattern of this time of year. So this shows that uh, the median return of uh, uh, August over the last 10 years is, is a plus 0.21. So nothing too exciting to write home about. Um, but here are the top stocks that have done well in the month of August, <clears throat> S&P stocks over the last 10 years. And so, you know, some of the, the, the top numbers aren't nearly as big as uh, like last month or some of the other months. But uh, I'm going to send you some of the charts uh, on here, uh, but you can see some of them have uh, gained 5% or more uh, around 70 to 80% of the time uh, over the last 10 August. So one that uh, on, on this list, you know, right here, uh, which you can see is uh, SNPS, it's uh, in the technology, you know, area, uh, which is synopsis, uh, looks to be forming a bullish ascending triangle 
over the last like 10 months. Uh, you'll notice at the 93 level, it's just continuing to struggle, you know, up there. But uh, if it would break out to the upside in the month of August, it has an average uh, gain of 5%. But if it would break out, the measured move has it running up to about the 107 level. So that's about 14% uh, above current prices. So uh, a breakout has not taken place, but I just want to let you know that I do have the buy alert uh, if it would you know, break out to the upside. So as a share, wanted to make it a little shorter and, and uh, cleaner for uh, this month. I uh, hope all of you have a great remainder of, of the summer. I appreciate you, your business and, and the understanding of the patients and the sideways chop. And I, and I can't re, uh, say enough that uh, the good to great, what could take place, the longer the sideways chop takes place, if the S&P breaks out to the upside, uh, please be prepared because it could really uh, pull in a lot of buyers. So wish all of you really well, and we'll see you next month. Take care, everyone. Thank you for your business.